this is Alice. Um, well, welcome everyone get on board ICANX this week. Uh, as you know, you know that ICANX was a Friday online talk continues for two more years. This week, we're going to have to be the one. 121 sessions of this ICANX talks. This is Alice from Beijing. Warm greetings to all of you, no matter where you are, and maybe in the early morning, or uh, maybe in the later evening. But okay, this ICANX is open for you. So uh, today is uh, our last session in this uh, uh, October. So in October, we really have a lot of new things here, and it's uh, very, very heavy, all these shining lights on this. The first week of ICANX and October is about HUST 70 years anniversary. So we invited two alumni from all of the world, one is from California Institute of Technology, one is from Peking University, two young, you know, outstanding alumni of Huadong University of Science and Technology to, you know, give a lecture here. And uh, then we have uh, two weeks for the light rising stars. So the young scientists from different part of the world to join this competition. And this today was the last day uh, of uh, October. We are so proud that we have Professor Martin Wagner uh, from uh, KIT, German. And uh, he's a very well-known professor in this 3D printing, uh, 3D laser printing or something. You know, everyone know him. Uh, but here, I want to add one more thing as uh, Professor Martin Wagner, also a guest professor from Huadong University of Science and Technology. This sounds so perfect for this month. <laughs> we have a beginning to celebrate. We have in the end of this week, we get the guest professor to celebrate too. Uh, so uh, let me, uh, you know, in today we have a two, you know, uh, things to do. One is for this uh, beautiful talk from Professor Martin Wagner. Another thing is we're going to announce of the two uh, young scientists award finalists in the end of this session. So uh, please, if you are candidate of these awards, please stay till the end. We will start announcement at 9.30 around that. So uh, please stay with us. Uh, let me uh, first welcome my best friends, Miso Kim from mm -hmm. SKKU, yeah, to in, uh, share this today's talk. So Miso. Stay oh, okay, thank you, Alice, um, for introducing me as your best friend. So hello, everybody. I'm Miso Kim from Songgyunkwan University, and I'm very excited. And I'm a little bit nervous because I'm taking this great privilege to introduce Professor Martin Wegener. So um, I'm a big fan of his research a lot, so that, that's why I'm very excited. So be, to begin with, let me introduce his bio a little bit. Um, and we said that we don't need his bio because he's so famous still. I want to explain a little bit. So he did his, his diploma and uh, PhD in physics and Johann, Johann Wolfgang Goethe University, Frankfurt. And then he spent two years as a postdoc at at and in the United States. And he became a professor at University Dortmund, Germany first. And then he became a professor at Institute of uh, Applied Physics at KIT. And then since then, he's a professor there and at the KIT. And he's also one of the directors of the uh, uh, Institute of Nanotechnology at KIT. And the, uh, his research interest, in, interests uh, expands uh, from ultra fast optics, extreme nonlinear optics, optical laser lithography, and phononic crystals, and uh, sorry, photonic crystals and optical metamaterial, um, mechanical, electronic, and thermodynamic metamaterials, which I'm very looking forward to hear about. And I have a number of lists, he, uh, number of he, list of he, the, the awards he received so far. I don't think I can list all of them here because there are so many. Uh, the most important thing that drew my attention is that He's been a highly cited researcher, top 1% since 2014, uh, which I'm very envious of. <laughs> and then, so now let's welcome Professor Martin Wegener and to, talk, uh, to listen to his talk. Martin, uh, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind and nice introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you today about 3D laser printing. Um, I put not everything we have ever done into it, but rather 
emphasize some recent things which I hope you will appreciate. Um, so this is the outline of my presentation today. Um, I will start with laser printing of polymers, tell you a little bit about two photon absorption. That's kind of the traditional way of doing it. But then I put more time into telling you about something new that we call two-step absorption that in a way I will explain, I think is a major step forward in this technology. And then uh, in the second main part, I will speak a bit about laser printing of liquid crystal elastomers, that is of stimulus responsive architectures or 4D printing in the jargon. And at the end, if time permits, I tell you about something fairly recent about laser printing of microelectronics that actually works, that is printing metals and semiconductors and not getting stuck with polymers um, for the rest of my life. So let me start with polymers and with this movie here. Um, the idea, the basic idea of laser printing is very simple. You take a laser focus like shown here. And then the idea is that only in the focal volume shown here in white, you induce by the light a chemical reaction that very often brings us from a liquid monomer to a solidified that is cross-linked polymer. And once you have scanned your focus as you wish, you wash out the insufficiently cross-linked material by a so-called developer that can be as simple as acetone or isopropanol. And then you have the three-dimensional structure, microstructure or nanostructure on a substrate like shown here. There's really nothing hidden. However, there are some important requirements here and that I would like to share with you in the next two videos. They will start in a second. On the left-hand side, you see a video where we assume that the local exposure dose or basically the density of chemical bonds that have formed locally is proportional to the intensity of light. That is a perfectly linear process. And on the right-hand side, I assume that the exposure dose goes like the intensity squared. And we will print in both videos a little table, a very simple object with a plate and four legs to it. And you will see uh, whether or not one can do this with linear optics. So the printing starts. Um, if you look on the right-hand side, you see the printing of the four legs, nothing very um, special so far. Now we start printing um, here the plate of the table and we repeat this. And now on the left-hand side, you can also see the plate coming. If you compare the right and the left-hand side, a quite well-defined table develops on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, um, you see big distortions. And the distortions become bigger the more complex the object is and the more local exposures you have. And the reason is very simple. If you have this focus, it, the focus has tails. Say if in the middle of the focus, I call the intensity 100% and at some point of the tail, you have 1% of that intensity. It doesn't sound much, but then when you scan the laser focus, you accumulate 1% very often, perhaps 100 times, and then you have a 100% effect. And that is the intuitive explanation for these very large distortions that you see here. You can barely recognize this table anymore. It becomes a lot better if you have a quadratic process, simply because if you take this 1% I was talking about and you square it, then you get to 1% of 1%, which is 10 to the minus four. And you can accumulate in the scanning 10 to the minus four much more often than you can 1% uh, before you get into trouble. You still have these tails um, in the community. This is referred to as the proximity effect, and they are a pain in the neck, but it's a lot better and good enough to be used if you have a quadratic process. Actually, it becomes better if you have a third order or fourth order process. Um, so one a way how this has traditionally been achieved is using two photon absorption. And um, this all started basically with Marie Göppert Meyer who in her PhD thesis at Göttingen, she came from Poland to Göttingen, worked out the theory of two photon absorption, which I illustrate with this little cartoon here on the lower right-hand side. So we consider an atom or a molecule in my case, the photoinitiator molecule. 
It's a molecule that triggers the chemical reaction. And here the light makes a transition of electrons from the ground state to some excited state, but not with a single photon, but with two photons. And each photon, so to speak, is proportional to the intensity of light. So the overall process, as Marie Göppert Meyer has described, goes like the intensity squared. And once you have the electron here, it then starts a chemical reaction. So everything is triggered by this process here. So this would be good enough, um, as I just explained, to um, have a well-defined three-dimensional printing process. Let me give you a feeling for some numbers here. So very often we don't take very large laser powers. We talk about 10 milliwatts, perhaps 100 milliwatts or so for one focus, but we use fairly short pulses and other people have done that too, like 100 femtosecond, for example. And you focus that light very tightly to the diffraction limit such that in the focus, you get intensities that are in the ballpark of one terawatt per centimeter squared. That is on the order of 10 to the 12 watt per centimeter squared. If these numbers don't mean anything to you, a typical nuclear power plant has a power of one gigawatt of 10 to the nine watt. So this is the power of 1000 nuclear power plants concentrated to one centimeter squared, which is about the area of my thumbnail. And if you did that, that would probably hurt a lot. But it's not a problem for us because we only do it for a short time and in a very small region of space. It's a huge number of photons per second and per area. And the reason I'm telling you this is because you can now take this number here and multiply it with a two photon coefficient that Marie Göbert Meyer has defined. In fact, today it's still, we still honor her with this abbreviation here, GM, the unit for Göppert Meyer. A good molecule has a coefficient of 1000 Göppert Meyer, and that would be this number here. And if you multiply these two numbers, then you get a cross section of the molecule uh, in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 16 centimeters squared. If this number doesn't mean anything to you, a typical molecule under ambient conditions has a cross section of 10 to the minus 15 centimeters squared for one photon absorption. So we need these crazy high intensities for two photon absorption to make two photon absorption roughly comparable in probability to one photon absorption. Otherwise, you would have to wait forever for these processes to finish. That's why we need these crazy high intensities. A bit of history, um, again, Marie Göppert Meyer did this in her PhD thesis and later published this work. Then pretty much 30 years, nothing has happened until Wolfgang Kaiser at Bell Labs at the time did the first experiments on two photon absorption. And um, that was shortly after the invention of the laser, big surprise. And then again, like another 30 years, nothing happened, at least nothing in terms of useful applications of two photon absorption until two photon laser microscopy, microscopy came along around 1990. And then a few years later until Soji Maru um, for the first time published two photon laser lithography. And we are going to follow basically in his footsteps in what I tell you about today. Um, in 2007, we founded a company um, doing that. And you see the instrument here. And um, I know that quite a few groups in China also have this instrumentation and all around uh, the world. This is not the latest kick. In 2019, they uh, came up with a new generation of instrument called Quantum X. And in 2021, that is last year, we actually sold the company. But that's, that's another story. Let me very briefly show you a couple of examples using two photon absorption, but I don't want to spend so much time on this because I've talked about this so often. This is one example actually taken from this reference here um, where lenses have been printed. Now, this is a really useful thing in industry. Things like that or like diffractive optical elements need to be printed and you need to have optical quality surfaces. In other words, the roughness of the surface must be on the scale of just a few nanometers root mean squared. 
And if you can print such optics, you can replicate them by soft imprinting or hot embossing and whatever. So many companies now in, in mass fabrication take nanoscribe instruments, they make a master of some micro optical component, and then they use some sort of a stamping technique to replicate this to thousands or millions. And that's, as far as I know, the biggest application of two photon absorption based printing these days. But you can also make truly three-dimensional objects. I've taken here an example from Harald Wiesen's group from Stuttgart. This is not my group, but um, they have used nanoscribe instrumentation to print lens systems. Here you see a single lens, you see a doublet, you see a triplet, fairly complicated structure. Again, it's important that the surface has optical quality and you can see that you can use these lenses. They have good imaging quality despite the fact that this is a 20 micron scale bar here. So the entire lens has perhaps the diameter on the scale of two human hairs or so. It's a very, very, very small lens that has been printed. And you might wonder, what is this good for? Well, you can print uh, these lenses, for example, onto the end facet of an optical fiber, and then use this in endoscopy to stick it into a human a body for surgery, for minimally invasive surgery. And obviously you want to make this needle kind of thing here as thin as you can. Still, you want to have the capability of doing imaging. And that's uh, one application of these lens systems here. And a bit in the same direction, I have a second example for you from Christian Kohs group here from KIT. Again, this is not my group, but they have used nanoscribe instrumentation to make these kind of devices here. And what they have in mind is building the next generation of optical circuits that will very likely be three dimensional in some sense. And what you have to do is you have to bring light from one plane like shown here into another plane. And for that, you need all kinds of mirrors, you need lenses, you need freeform optics to steer the beams in three dimensions. And all of this can be done and directly 3D printed by this technology. Again, it's crucial that the surfaces have optical quality. Otherwise, you will have very large undesirable losses. Um, with this, I stop this part. There are thousands of other applications one could probably show here. And I rather ask a question that I have often been asked, and that is, um, Something like this, Martin, this is all very nice. You can print structures even down to the submicron scale. You can do things that you can probably not do with other technologies, but isn't this very slow because you are scanning this focus? And this uh, triggered us in this publication to really compare all kinds of 3D additive manufacturing approaches in terms of speed, including um, our two photon printing. And this led us to this figure here. Uh, it's a bit complicated, sorry for that. You see on the vertical axis, the printing rate, the peak printing rate in units of voxels per second, how many units we can print per second. And I argue that this is the only meaningful way you can compare the speed of different 3D additive manufacturing approaches um, because they may have very different voxel size. Some people use printed volume per second, and particularly people having big voxels, that is bad resolution, tend to do this. But this is not meaningful because basically the information that you put into your structure is directly connected to the voxels, which I try to emphasize on the right-hand side. One voxel, so to speak, is one bit that you imprint into the structure. And this is a logarithmic scale. And I do this versus the inverse voxel size, if you find that strange, you find the absolute voxel size at the top. So this goes from 10 nanometer, 100 nanometer, one micron, 10 microns, 100 microns, a millimeter or so. And these are all kinds of technologies that I cannot explain all to you. And um, the red stuff you see here is two photon based laser printing, but you see other things like inkjet printing, like projection, micro lithography. And you will see that many of them come to peak printing rates, the faster ones in the ballpark of 10 to the six voxels per second or so, but not much faster. There are some rare exceptions here. This is inkjet printing from, from HP Labs, a printer that has 15,000 nozzles that print in parallel. And this I compare with this 
single focus stuff of two photon printing here, at least when I write n equal one, that means a single focus. And you can see that many of these technologies also come to fairly high speed. And in fact, this one that uses nine laser foci scanned in parallel is about the fastest that we get today. It's in the ballpark of 10 to the seven voxels per second printed at a few hundred nanometers voxel size or minimum feature size in three dimensions, not on a substrate, although that would be cheating. Um, so if you want to do something on a scale of 10 microns or so, I suggest you just take these technologies. I'm not saying that two photon printing is good for everything, but if you aim for sub-micron feature sizes, then my statement is that there are not so many technologies out there that allow for doing that. And the fastest one of them for sure is two photon based printing. There are some examples from electrochemical printing down here, some examples from electron beam induced deposition down here. But you must look at the scale here. They are in a range of say one voxel or 10 voxels printed per second. And if this doesn't mean anything to you, let me show you these numbers. If at a print rate of 10 to the seven voxels per second, one object takes you, for example, one minute to print, which I would consider a reasonable time, then the same object would take you 20 years to print if you do it at a print rate of one voxel per second, which is this um, point, this, this uh, level here, and some are even below this level. So you must be aware that there are huge differences in printing speed out there. If you are interested, we have put this also onto a website that we update um, and you can find fairly many um, recent publications on this website. It all came from this publication here. Um, so if you care, have a look on this website. And I wanna show you um, perhaps one uh, example here from this printing with nine laser foci, which is schematically shown here in the process of printing a metamaterial. So obviously this is nine times as fast as if you do it with a single focus. Um, and doing that, we have made these metamaterial samples here um, that are about a centimeter in height. They contain more than 100,000 fairly complex, as you will see, three-dimensional unit cells and more than 300 billion voxels, which to my knowledge is the largest number of voxel, voxels printed in a single object, as far as I know. Um, it's a periodic structure. You can tell right away if you put a laser pointer to it, it diffracts the light in this nice lower pattern here. This is a measured result in the background. Or you can also magnify this photograph. Now you can guess the periodicity of the structure. Again, it's like a centimeter in height or so, yet it contains sub-micrometer definition. Here you see some oblique view electron micrograph of the many, many unit cells in this metamaterial structure. Here you see a zoom in. For the experts, there are two levels of stitching that are very hard to see actually on these images. And that's a good thing because you do not want to see stitching. Here's another view of another structure. So you can make very, very complex and large structures with this technology. And um, for a reason, I'm showing you actually the setup with which we did this. This has nothing to do with nanoscribe. This has been done in our labs. Here you see the optical table with the instrument and I turn it around and um, you see the laser, the femtosecond laser that is used. You see all kinds of optics and then eventually we focus the light here to do the printing. And if you look at the size and at the cost of the instrumentation, this piece here is by far the most expensive thing in the entire setup. And I tell you that all these components here you see in the foreground, we only need to compensate group velocity dispersion, temporal group velocity dispersion, spatial group velocity dispersion. And for many years, actually, I have been thinking, can't we somehow replace the femtosecond laser by a simple semiconductor diode and bring the cost down from say 100,000 euro or so you have to spend for such a laser to the level of one euro or so. And that's basically what the next part of my talk is all about. And this brings me to two-step absorption, which we use to potentially replace 
through photon absorption. So what is this? Um, first of all, I should like to acknowledge my co-authors on this fairly um, recent stuff here, in particular, Vincent Hahn, who did all these things in the framework of his PhD thesis. He will now go to industry. And the first part is about using a single laser color. Um, so how does that go? Um, I start here with two photon absorption, basically the same diagram I showed you before. We have the ground state of a molecule, we have an excited state of a molecule, and the aim is to excite electrons to the upper state. And from there, they trigger a chemical reaction. We do this with two photons because we want this quadratic nonlinearity. I told you all that. Sometimes in textbooks, you will see people drawing a dashed horizontal line here and call this a virtual state. In fact, I've been asked in my own PhD examination, Mr. Wegener, um, is the virtual state a state or is it not a state? I don't quite remember what I said at the time, but what I would say now is, yes, this virtual state is a state, but it is a state of the combined system of electrons and light. It's a mixed state. It's a hybrid state of matter and light. And as long as the light field is switched on, this is a state you can occupy. But if we use 100 femtosecond laser pulses, then the lifetime, so to speak, of this state is very short. It's in the range of 100 femtoseconds. But during that time, you can put an electron here and then bring it further up. Why am I telling you all this? Well, if you say it like that, then you might have the idea, why don't we replace this so-called virtual state by a real state? And that's what I'm going to do here. Um, so here I talk about, on the right-hand side, a, a molecule that has electronic states. This is a state that is there without the light. It can have a lifetime, say, of tau can range from microseconds to milliseconds to second, it depends. For our conditions, the molecules will have lifetimes here of this state in the range of 100 microseconds or so. And now the point is the following. You can take one photon absorption to bring an electron from the ground state to this intermediate or idle state. If you wish, you can wait a while here. And then with a second photon, but again by one photon absorption, you can make an absorption process to the upper excited state and bring the electron here, and it would then equally start a chemical reaction. Now you have two photons involved, so this process here also goes quadratic in the intensity, just like the process on the left-hand side, if you do it right. Um, there are two photons involved, it goes quadratic, so what's the difference? Again, the difference is here you must absorb these two photons simultaneously, whereas here you can absorb them sequentially. And as a result, you do not need femtosecond laser pulses for this process that we have nicknamed two-step absorption because there are two steps in the absorption process. It's basically like upconversion luminescence. You may have heard about this, where you would look at luminescence from this upper state uh, we are not looking at luminescence. We directly start a chemical reaction from here. I don't like this notion of upconversion so much because that is also used in nonlinear optics in a very different context. So in any case, we have called this process to step absorption here. You can um, study this, of course, more mathematically to make the difference clear. To photon absorption, as usual, is proportional to the imaginary part of the third order nonlinear optical susceptibility, whereas two step absorption is proportional to the product of two imaginary parts of linear optical susceptibilities. So, this is not nonlinear optics in the usual sense. You can modify this diagram, and that's what's going to happen in the experiment. You can have some intermediate relaxation, non radiative relaxation. This doesn't make a difference at all provided this relaxation process here is fast enough. If it's slow, it does make a difference. But if this is fast, it's often on the picosecond time scale, then it's um, the same story and you can do it like this as well. This is how it's going to look like in our experiments. And just to not confuse you in our experiments, these are going to be blue photons. We use 
405 nanometer light, not red light for two photon absorption. Most of the research has been done using red light using 800 nanometers wavelength of light. Um, let me perhaps um, shorten this a little bit. Um, if you study this in a bit more detail and you write down the rate equations for this process that I just described, you have two rates. The first rate that brings electrons from the ground state to the intermediate level and the second rate that brings them from there to the upper excited state. These are these two rates here. And we normalize them by the decay rate, the inverse of the lifetime of this state, which is now very, very important. The lifetime of this state plays a crucial role. So we normalize things here to get a universal plot. And what you find here is that if your intensities are low enough, that is if the two rates are small enough, then you are in this region here. And then the nonlinear exponent, as you can calculate, it's even semi-analytical, um, is an exponent of two. That's what we target. But then if you scan your focus faster and faster, you must be a bit careful because if you scan your focus faster, you must increase the intensity of light because you must deposit a certain energy on in the time that the focus spends in a certain region. In other words, if you scan faster, you must increase your intensity and that means you walk um, along such diagonal lines here. And um, this means you slowly walk out of this region where you have a nonlinearity of one. And if you scan too fast, eventually you are back to linear optics. In this case, you saturate the intermediate level and then you cannot 3D print as I explained in the beginning. So in long words, the long lifetime of the intermediate state has good sides. It means that we can use continuous wave lasers and continuous wave lasers with fairly low powers, as you will see. But there are also limitations then in terms of how fast you can scan the focus uh, because of the argument I just outlined. Um, when we started this, we had no idea really what to look for. And we looked for um, photoresists, photo initiators, I should say, in the family of so-called reluctant nourish type one photo initiators. Reluctant means that after photo excitation, almost nothing happens. So typically these are considered as bad photoresists. For us, they are good because after the absorption of the first photon, actually nothing should happen. So in this search, we came across benzene, which is still a very good candidate. It's a molecule shown here. And I'll also show you um, the Ablonsky diagram of that molecule here. And um, so what happens is we have a first one photon absorption process from the singlet ground state manifold to the excited manifold. You have vibrational relaxation, intersystem crossing to the triplet manifold of the molecule. Then the electron first sits here and ideally nothing should happen. So what uh, if nothing happens, then we can come with a second photon absorb it, bring the electron up here, generate radicals and start the entire process. Um, and the absorption spectra, this absorption spectrum and this are shown here in dark blue and light blue respectively. You see they are not the same, but they overlap. And if we use four or five nanometers wavelength, we can excite both of these transitions with a single laser color. That's basically what we do. Now, a point that took us two years is that if you have an electron here and you wait long enough, then always something happens, some side reaction starts. And this, the most prominent side reaction is the abstraction of hydrogen atoms from the surrounding, which means you also generate radicals and start the polymerization reaction. But that's bad because here you have only absorbed one photon until you get here. And as I explained in the beginning, this doesn't work. So what we do is we put molecules that are called scavengers. In this case, BT-POS, you see it's spelled out here. I will not read this to you, uh, into the photoresist in, on the order of 1% or so in volume. And what this means is that this, these molecules capture the, the protons and bring the system back to the ground state as if nothing has happened. 
um, such that at the end, we only get this process here, which goes quadratic in the intensity. It's illustrated here, perhaps in a bit more a graphical form. We have the laser focus with its tails in the blue. Uh, you see benzyl molecules in the background. So here in the tails, or you can see it here, and the benzyl is excited. It in fact even undergoes a conformational change, but no reaction is started only in the focal volume where the intensity is large enough to make two steps. You um, excite the molecule such that it breaks apart, it literally fractures, it dissociates. And these fragments then start the chemical reaction and that goes like the intensity squared. Now, um, <clears throat> this is very, very detailed. Perhaps I do this quite short here. If you look at the threshold power on a log scale versus the exposure times, you find this behavior. And you see that you have a transition from two different slopes here. And trust me on that, if you compare this with rate equation modeling, what this gives you is, first of all, um, that what we see is consistent with the rate equation modeling. But it also tells you what is the lifetime of the intermediate state under the conditions of our experiment. And as I said before, it's in the range of 100 microseconds. In fact, here it's like 80 microseconds or so, and that is important. So here you see the laser that we have then been using. If you remember the femtosecond laser I showed you earlier, this is a lot smaller. It costs a few euros, has way too much power for us. This is a semiconductor um, laser diode um, operating at 405 nanometers here. Um, it has a fairly bad spatial mode. So we do some spatial mode filtering, which is easy because at the end we need less than one milliwatt of laser power uh, for the experiments that we do. We can still nicely focus the light here with a numerical aperture of 1.4. You can see the measured foci in this picture. These are 100 nanometer scale bars and the full width at half maximum of the squared intensity profile is pretty much exactly 100 nanometer. And that is also the lateral resolution. And I mean resolution, not just feature size, it's the resolution. And you will see this later in our printing um, experiments. Indeed, here are some examples of structures that we have printed along these lines. This was published end of last year. You can see some small helices. You can see a buckyball, the ubiquitous Benchy boat that everyone in the 3D additive manufacturing community prints, some small piece of a meta material. Perhaps I zoom into this thing here and the experts will see some interesting numbers on the right hand side. First of all, you can see very well defined structures here. You can see the individual voxels. We go down to a buckyball that is smaller than five microns in diameter here. The hatching distance is 30 nanometers, slicing is 100 nanometers. We use uh, 320 microwatt of power, micro, not milli. There's a very small power here. The scan speed is limited, I told you that, but it's not ridiculously slow. It's a decent speed. We use one millimeter per second here that leads us to this print rate, which is not super high, but still it's a good uh, rate to do meaningful things. But you cannot tell really what the limits are and whether this is better than other things that have been published in the literature. So if you want to quantify resolution, you have to do the same thing that basically people in semiconductor chip industry do. When they come up with a new lithographic approach, they print gratings and they just check what the period or the, the pitch of the grating is. And then they can directly compare different things. Now, we are not aiming at two-dimensional structures, but three-dimensional structures. So you can think of this wood pile photonic crystal here that is defined by this picture as the counterpart of a two-dimensional grating. So we'll print such wood piles and see how small we can make this rod spacing. And this is the benchmark we have been using for many years. In fact, also in this publication where we added to, to photon-based laser printing um, um, stimulated emission depletion. And here you see some um, images. These are optical micrographs. This is an array of wood piles that you're looking at. We play with the excitation power. This goes from underexposed to overexposed. And here in the different rows, uh, we play with the 
period with the rod spacing as indicated on the right hand side. And you see, you can go down to rod spacings down to 200 or so nanometers. Um, <clears throat> And here we are pretty much at the limit, but they are still colorful. These are black colors that you see here, basically. And if this picture does not mean anything to you, let me tell you that if you take commercial, the best commercial two photon based laser printing that uses 800 nanometers wavelength rough, roughly, you cannot print any of these structures. The smallest that has been printed by Michael Thiel at Nanoscribe was 500 nanometers, which is not in this picture. So we do a lot better than two photon absorption, but this is not a surprise <clears throat> because we are using a wavelength that is a factor of two shorter than what is usually used in two photon absorption. But this tells you that two step absorption does give you the required nonlinearity as two photon absorption. And if you do not like such optical micrographs, let me show you this guy here. As an electron micrograph, this has a 300 nanometer rod spacing. It's printed with a lower power at 45 microwatts or so. This is getting really to the limits of things here. And if you want to know how this thing looks deep inside, we have also looked at that. And here you see a reconstruction from ultra microtomy. Uh, ask me if you do not know what that is. It's a method how you can look into the structure really. And uh, if you look at this thing long enough, you see that it's an open structure. It looks like it should look like um, and not, uh, it's not contaminated by the proximity effect, which can happen actually if you are not careful, even with two photon absorption. So the way I see this going is that this might make uh, 3D laser printers on the nanometer scale a lot less expensive. At the moment, you would probably have to pay some hundred thousand dollar or euro for that. I could imagine that you bring this down to less than a thousand euros, but we will see. There's some project that we have together with Nanoscribe ongoing in this direction. Uh, what I rather want to show you is here uh, using two laser colors. That's a different approach. And uh, I again start from these simple level diagrams here. You could use two different colors, even with two photon absorption. You could use blue light and red light, but this um, I think would be pointless. We rather do it again with two step absorption. So the basic difference to what I showed you before is that now this intermediate level is not approximately in the middle between these two levels, but it's asymmetric. That first you must absorb a blue photon and then you absorb a red photon. So in a way, it's like a logical end gate because if you switch off the... Approximately the occupation of the upper level goes like the product of the two um, intensities here. Um, I get a message here that my internet connection is not quite stable. I hope this does not affect the transmission. Um, I just, just continue. For one or two seconds there. So am I back now? Yes, you're fine. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so you can again modify this and have some intermediate fast relaxation. No big deal here. And uh, why would you do this? Well, first of all, a bit to the history. Um, this idea is fairly old. It goes back to the best of my knowledge to 1974. This is, by the way, long before the famous patents of Hall on 3D printing, where this author here, Jones, is speculated about the possibility of having two laser beams that cross, um, and only in the crossing point you would polymerize a material. That was in 1974. Uh, Swainson basically published the same idea in 1977 as a US patent. Uh, and here you see a picture. I colored the picture only where the two laser beams cross. Here you would get polymerization and you could print a, a 3D object with that. Now, in my view, that would be pointless because it's the same that I told you um, in the talk before. Um, but what you can do now is the following. You can combine this with the idea of using light sheets. 
Now, um, these are the two publications I cited. Light sheets in microscopy and optical microscopy are very well known, and I give two references here. Now, in 3D printing, they are not so well known. To the best of my knowledge, we published this for the first time in 2019. Another group published a paper without citing us uh, in Nature in 2020. And now I show you our results. The idea is that you project an entire image. Think of this as a very large number of laser foci, if you want, 10,000 and more laser foci. Without anything else, this doesn't work because again, the tails of the laser focus, if you expose them all in parallel, would overlap and you would expose all this material. And now the trick is you use the light sheet to section a certain Z coordinate here and use a photoresist, as I explained, where only at locations where you have the red light and the blue light on, you would start a polymerization reaction. So you would start it here where my cursor is, but you would not start it here where my cursor is uh, now. And then you scan this plane and you print a three-dimensional object with that. And the obvious advantage is that it gets faster with the number of foci or pixels that you use for this projection. And there are limitations. Um, if you want an extended um, light sheet here, you want that the Rayleigh length in the language of optics is much larger than the thickness of the beam waist. Otherwise you lose the sheet and it becomes a line and you lose the entire parallel advantage. Uh, so you want that the Rayleigh length is large compared to the beam waist. And if you remember your optics course, the ratio of uh, Rayleigh length and beam waist is basically one over the numerical aperture. So if this number here, you want this to be large, then this means the numerical aperture must be small. And this means you cannot really get to the absolute diffraction limit, but you can get to reasonable resolutions as I will show you in just a second. Here we must use a different molecule. We use a molecule called biacetyl shown here. It's a very well-known and quite simple molecule, but not used for this purpose previously. Um, you see again in this panel here, the Jablonski diagram. We have a first absorption process from the singlet ground state manifold to the singlet excited state manifold in the blue. And you can see the absorption or extinction spectrum here um, on, on the right-hand side where my cursor is now. Um, then you can have um, <clears throat> Vibrational relaxation in the system crossing to the triplet state, same as before. You want to prevent any side reactions. And if you are successful with that, you then need a second red photon in this case to go up here and generate radicals and start the chemical reaction. And now it's important that the, the spectrum, the absorption spectrum of this process um, has no overlap with the other one. And you can see that the blue spectrum basically in this region here has no overlap with the red spectrum. And that is important for this idea of light sheet printing. We use a different scavenger in this case here. And uh, we use a fairly normal acrylate here. Here it's done with a hexaacrylate. More recently, we have also done it with a triacrylate, which is the basis of everything I told you before. This also works. This, by the way, has just come out two weeks ago or so, at least online. And um, you can look at it online. It's not there yet, I think, in, in printed format. And um, so again, a more uh, artistic visualization of how this works. We have the biacetyl molecule shown here schematically. If you illuminate it with red light, literally nothing happens. If you illuminate it with blue light, you do excite the molecule, but you do not break it apart. And only in spatial regions where you have the blue light and the red light on together, um, you get um, this excitation I talked about, which means that the molecule dissociates, you generate radicals, and they start the chemical polymerization reaction as we try to illustrate here. Um, let me just forget about this picture. Um, that's how it looks in the lab. You see basically one lens by which we project the images. You can see barely perhaps here where my cursor goes, the second lens that focuses the light sheet we focus this into a cuvette and we print 
on the end of this little glass rod here uh, at this point, <clears throat> some numbers. The, the blue wavelength is 440 nanometers. The red one is 660 nanometers. We now need some power because we have 33,000 independent pixels. This is like having 33,000 foci in parallel. Actually, the LCD, the liquid crystal display that we use for generating these images has more pixels, but we must group them to some extent because we don't have enough power otherwise. The max frame rate, and we are operating almost at the max frame rate, is 700 hertz. So it takes us one over 700 um, seconds um, to print one layer basically here. Um, I skip this because I'm over time here. Um, here you see some test structures, some little rods suspended between these walls. And we do this to uh, determine the voxel width and the, the voxel height in an un unambiguous manner. You can see the voxel width here in blue. You can see this goes down to about half a micron or so, the voxel width. We take these data because this is 100% reliable. If you go to smaller features, we still have like 70% reliability, um, but we try to be a bit more conservative than some of our competitors. Um, so we take this as the limit here, it's half a micron in width, and the voxel height is about two microns. It's a bit higher. And so the voxel volume is still below a micron cube. It's not quite the feature sizes you could get with the techniques I told you about before, but this is a hell of a lot faster. Uh, and here you see a gallery of uh, things um, that we have printed, some rolling knot structures, some bucky balls here, um, some banshee board structures, and two pieces of meta materials that we enjoy so much in my group. I want to end this part here by showing you the movie in real time, how these Banshee boats were printed. And that comes here. I hope it runs in real time via the internet. It will repeat. The printing of one boat now takes only 266 milliseconds. It's almost faster than you can look. And this is because, I repeat this, we use 33,000 foci effectively in parallel to print. So we get faster by this factor here. We have a print rate that is effectively close to 10 to the seven voxels per second again, and uh, some other numbers here, on, on some information here on the photo resist. Um, it's all published and um, disclosed here in this, in this publication you see at the bottom. So I'm looking um, onto my clock here. Um, Perhaps I do speak about the laser printing of liquid crystal elastomers, and then I stop, I'm afraid, otherwise I will go massively over time. So I switch gears now. I go back to two photon absorption, um, but we now print more fancy structures in the sense that they can be actuated by some stimulus. And the stimulus we have been looking at is light. We want to make structures that can be actuated by light at reasonable intensities, not lasers, that you can use LEDs to actuate such microstructures. Um, I should like to acknowledge my co-authors on this part. It's in particular Alexander Münchinger, who did this in the framework of his PhD thesis, but these others, um, other friends here have collaborated as listed here. Um, a bit of introduction, perhaps not everybody is um, familiar with liquid crystal elastomers. This is taken from this publication, not my work, just for an illustration. In liquid crystal elastomers, you have um, elongated molecules that are sometimes called mesogens that are elongated. And the trick is that you want to align these elongated molecules. And if you succeed in aligning them, then you can characterize the material by a so-called director that gives you this axis along which the molecules are at least predominantly aligned. This is called the nematic phase. Now, if this, say, is the situation at room temperature, this means that if you increase the temperature, then such a material will shrink. It's a bit unusual. It will shrink in the direction of the director, as shown here. 
and it will expand in the orthogonal direction. It's very highly anisotropic, the behavior. In one direction, it shrinks. In the other direction, sorry, it expands. And this is the mechanism we want to use for uh, our structures. Um, there has been tons of work, and I cite some of that um, as a disclaimer here, that have oriented the director at a surface. But this, to my taste, is not good enough. I want to be able to align the director at each point in three-dimensional space along any axis that I want to make fancy, sophisticated structures. And this has not been possible before, but I show you now a way how you can do this. And the way Alexander Münchinger did this is he integrated into the laser printing setup a special sample cell, which allows us to apply voltages, and that is electric fields, during the print job. And this is schematically shown here on the right-hand side. Here you see an actual photograph of the electrodes. These are optically transparent electrodes, indium tin oxide electrodes. And this here would be our print field, so to speak. So this is a side view. We have the laser focus here. And now you can say apply a voltage between these two electrodes. And this will give you a horizontally oriented electric field. And this electric field, it's a quasi static electric field at about a kilohertz or so frequency. This aligns the uh, director of the liquid crystal uh, molecules here such that it's uh, along this axis. And then we expose the structure by light. We polymerize it as I explained in the beginning. And this so to speak freezes now the orientation of the director because the material has become solid. All the rest is liquid. And now you can move to a different spot, very schematically shown here, and now say apply a voltage between this electrode and this electrode. Now you have a vertical electric field. Now you align the director along the vertical axis. You expose it by light, you freeze it, and along this lines, you can get any director at any point in space. We have many electrodes, and by applying voltages, we can also have diagonal uh, electric fields in any direction that we wish. Now, what I do not tell you here is one thing that is actually quite important. If you succeed in aligning the director, then this means that the material becomes optically biofringent, and this completely messes up the focus if you come in with ordinary linear polarization of light. So to avoid this in general, you have to put special face masks to focus the light in an azimuthal polarization configuration. And then despite the fact that the material is optically biofringent, you can get a single focus. And we check this by printing these little mushroom structure, structures that you see at the bottom, basically in a cross polarizer microscope. And some pieces should be dark and they are dark. So this is just our check that we have actually succeeded in aligning the director. Let me show you two examples and then I stop. Uh, the first example is just a test and was published in, in this paper here earlier this year. We printed such a star structure no particular meaning, it's just a test structure. Um, and the director that we printed is indicated here. So you have one, two, three, four, five different orientations of the director. And the reason we do this is that this basically creates a bi-material beam. So if these materials here expand differently, like I explained, then this beam will bend. And that's exactly what you see here if you increase the temperature in this sequence. You can see it actually much better in this fake movie here. This is done under ambient conditions, just in room conditions. And you can get very large and repeatable actuation on the scale shown here. And that's again the electron micrograph of the same structure. You can see that the feature sizes and resolution is not as good as you get for ordinary polymers. Well, sorry, that's the best we can get so far. But uh, here you have the possibility to actuate the structures with large amplitudes. And the second and last thing I want to share with you is, uh, is the following. Here we wanted to make a metamaterial, the properties of which can be changed. 
by light and can be changed a lot by light, not, not just a little bit. So what do we do? Uh, I show you two examples, uh, two different unit cells of a metamaterial. In both cases, we need different orientations of the director shown here by this false color scale. So here you only have a director along X and a director along Y. And you see these bimaterial elements that will bend and they will effectively change the Poisson's ratio. They will even change the sign of the Poisson's ratio of the structure if you illuminate the structure with light. The second example is more complex. It's a chiral metamaterial that has nine different orientations of the director at different points in three-dimensional space. So no way you can make such a structure if you can only align the director at a surface of a substrate or so. And the purpose here is to change the handedness of the structure by shining light onto it. And here you see some images of the auxetic structure where we change the Poisson's ratio. You see an electron micrograph. Again, this is the best quality we can get. This is by far not as good as what we can get with ordinary polymers. Um, sorry, but that's the best I have seen so far. On the right-hand side, you see the same structure, but under an optical micrograph. And here you see something I have not told you yet, that in a second step, we then infiltrate dye molecules that actually covalently bind to the polymer inside such that they stick in the structure. And these uh, molecules serve as absorber for the light. So they convert the light into a local heating and the local heating leads to the actuation I have described. And here you see some movies to warm up. With the dye molecules, you see the auxetic structure. It has the same size as the one on the previous view graph. Sorry that there is no scale bar here. You can see that you get very large actuations. And you can also see that the sim that the, the um, unit cell changes so much that here you have a bow tie and here you do not. So this thing will have a negative Poisson's ratio. This thing has a positive Poisson's ratio. And the dye molecules are important. If you have the feeling nothing is happening on the right-hand side, you sometimes see the light level changing a little bit. In fact, here something does happen, but it's so small that you cannot see it. This is just our control experiment that the dye molecules are actually as important as we think they are. And you can do this many, many times. You can do it reasonably fast. This is not super fast, takes you 75 or 63 milliseconds or so for the um, <clears throat> actuation and for the recovery. It's reasonably fast. And what we have done now is the following. We have taken the structure, we have illuminated it with light, it changes its structure. And then while the light is kept on, we measure in a mechanical probe station, the mechanical properties. And here we have by image cross correlation analysis, you can see two images here as examples. We have found that we can change the Poisson's ratio. We can change it from say 0.5 or so, make it smaller, make it zero. We can even flip the sign of the Poisson's ratio and bring it down to approximately minus 0.3 or so in agreement with theory. It's not perfectly homogeneous over the structure, but the average Poisson's ratio behaves like um, what I tell you here. And what I should perhaps say is one amp of this light emitting diode at 450 nanometers wavelength means that the intensity of light is about 20 watts per centimeter squared. So it's bright light, but this is not a laser and there's no focusing. We in, tech, in fact take the collimated light emitting diode and by that we can induce huge changes of the mechanical properties and they are reversible and repeatable many, many times. And I now show you the same thing for the chiral metamaterial, which is a much more complex structure yet. This is the measured electron micrograph. This is a rendering of how it should look like ideally. So again, these, this is fairly hard to make these structures. It's not the same quality as ordinary two photon or two step laser printing, but you can actuate these structures a lot. This has, by the way, come out in materials today, a few weeks ago. 
Um, it's available online, but it has not been printed uh, yet. And here um, you see the measured twist per strain. So the physics here is we take the sample, we push on it. Because it is chiral, it twists a little bit. And uh, depending on the handedness, this twist is positive or it becomes zero. Or here we have even reversed the handedness of the structure by shining on light onto the structure. And you can see two stills of at least the side view of this three-dimensional structure together with theoretical calculations with finite element simulations for this fairly complex structure on the right-hand side. So the bottom line here is we can make stimulus-responsive architectures that change the mechanical properties of metamaterials by a lot. We can change even the sign of the property in these two examples. Now, I originally planned to also speak about this part, but I'm almost speaking for one hour. So I rush over this stuff um, and do not speak about this at all, even though this is quite exciting. Um, this is stuff where we have recently printed metals and semiconductors to get functional microelectronic devices, but I don't want to go too much over time here. I think the challenge that remains is to get to finer features in laser printing, go below 100 nanometers or so, make this yet faster. Many customers of Nanoscribe want faster printing much more than they want finer features. And um, I think one other challenge is to make more dissimilar materials available for this kind of technology. For a long time, it has only been polymers. I showed you some um, stimulus responsive liquid crystal elastomers. I wanted to speak about semiconductors and metals a little bit, but I haven't. Um, but this will, I think, be a big trend in the next couple of years to 3D print with lasers, many different materials on a micrometer and sub-micrometer scale. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. I should like to acknowledge uh, our funding bodies. Um, in the beginning, we chatted a little bit about the excellence cluster, uh, 3D matter made to order that we have in Karlsruhe and at the Universität Heidelberg. Uh, there has been funding from Nanoscribe, the Hector Fellow Academy, Max Planck School of Photonics, all of these bodies that you see here, and the people I already, I already mentioned. If you have questions, feel free to ask them now but you can also send me an email and I give you my email address here. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I go out of the screen sharing mode uh, for a second. Okay, thank you so much. It was a beautiful, beautiful, so all, all the slides were uh, like full, filled with all, like beautiful images. I cannot take my eyes off. Thank you so much. And uh, now we can have a, like a very uh, productive uh, and panel discussion with Martin. And um, let me introduce other panelists as well. So here's our professor Nick Van. Uh, you can notice that the, his big move from MIT to the University of Hong Kong here. So uh, we have professor Nick Van as a one of our great panelists here. And then let me introduce um, professor Hong Bo Sun. Uh, from Tsinghua University. Um, now I can see that he has published over 500 scientific, over 500 scientific pa papers so far. That was the, the phrase I wanted to introduce here. Okay, so um, he's, a, uh, he's an expert in laser micro nanofabrication and other novel optical and electronic devices as well. So welcome on, on board as a panelist. And again, here, um, yeah, surprise. So we have Paul here again as a panelist. Welcome, Paul. Um, you know, everybody knows Paul. So he's a professor at the University of uh, California, Los Angeles, UCLA. So nice to see you again. <laughs> so, and we have a great uh, challenger here, ex-challenger. So who should challenge us tonight? Um, from uh, Dr. Jiu Shu Ai Shu, I'm sorry, from Germany. So welcome on board, everybody. So let's discuss. Okay, we are everybody's here on stage. Yes, I can see everybody here. So first of all, Martin, thank you so much for bringing up so many, uh, so great, inspiring talks here. And then I wish I could hear the last part, but probably we have to invite you again, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, we should. Yeah. yeah. We can start from Jiu Shuai or challengers. Jiu Shuai yes, yes, yes. 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 So thank you, Martin, for your yeah fantastic talk. So I, I was working on the silicon or the other semiconductor manufacturing. So several weeks ago, I got this task or chance to learn the 3D nano printing. So this is a, also a new topic for me. So as a layman, I think maybe I have the question similar to the online audience like uh, the uh, our audience so when i see your like uh, impressive figures and videos there's a story come to my mind it's like ancient chinese fairy tales called uh, um, ma liang with the magic pen so he likes john he got the magic magic pen from the god so everything he draw become alive or become real like from two-dimensional to three-dimensional this is my feeling like uh, i do the uh, conventional lithography when i see this uh, multi-photo lithography is also from 2d to 3d so but my first confusing will be how do you control like the adult uh, adoption to be two photo uh, photons not three photons not four photons uh, how do you control that well if you speak about two photon absorption you must take a material that is transparent at the wavelength you are using to one photon absorption so actually, all of these photoresists, these monomers, they look transparent to the human eye if you put them in a little bottle, even in macroscopic quantities. And uh, you put a little bit of what we call a photo initiator molecule into it. And that has a transition in the UV. And you must take together two red photons to make the transition. That is not so difficult. You just take something that doesn't absorb with one photon absorption, and then you need something that absorbs two photons. When I started this stuff many years ago, I thought this would be very difficult, but actually you can take almost anything and it will show two photon absorption. This is not very special. You have to work a little bit if you want efficient two photon absorption, then you can spend some years on it. And But basically this, is the first process that happens when you increase the intensity. I'm saying this because you asked about three photons and four photons. If you keep increasing the intensity, in fact, in many situations, we have also seen three photon and four photon absorption. For example, you can also leave away the photo initiator molecule that I mentioned and directly excite the homo to lumo transition of the monomer so to speak, the band gap, as a semiconductor physicist would say, of the monomer, and you take four photons uh, to excite that. That also works. Um, then the intensity goes with the exponent of four. And that's even better because you even better get rid of the tails of the laser focus. The thing is that if you go to third order, fourth order, or even fifth order processes, which we have done, it tends to become a little bit more critical. Um, um, there is a window between the intensity at which you get polymerization, which you want. So you increase it from zero, the intensity to this point. At this point, you would get polymerization. And then if you keep increasing the intensity, at some point, you will see that you get explosions in the photoresist, micro explosions, nothing terrible, very small explosions. But they mean that the material is destroyed. You do not want this. And in a good photoresist, like the stuff that Nanoscribe sells you, there's about a factor of two or three between the point of polymerization and the point of getting micro explosions. Now, if you ask the same question for three photon, four photon, and four, five, five photon absorption, this window is getting very small. It can happen that at some point you get nice polymerization, but then you increase your laser intensity by 2% and everything explodes. So you can do things like that in the lab, but as a technology that should be reliable and usable by everybody, this is not a very favorable situation to be used. So this is my very, very long answer to your question. How about three photon and four photon absorption? Yeah. Yes, in principle, very good, but in practice, not so good. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very good answer to let me know that this uh, magic is not from God, it's from mm -hmm. science. So, and uh, I have another question for the architect 
uh, Wagner. So you built like so many great, like wonderful structures. I, uh, the voxel is a um, one most important conception when you're talking about building the nanostructures. So what are the metaphor I can thought I think is about um, voxel is maybe the nano uh, Lego bricks which you can build mm -hmm. and create different things. So. Um, Maybe I, as far as I know, when you change the wavelength of the laser, maybe you can have also even smaller uh, scale. What's what's the range, like the minimal dimension you can have, or what's the high aspect ratio you can have? Because for the polymers, especially polymers, you don't have so good mechanical property. So normally mm -hmm. you can have maybe some structures, but not high aspect ratio, uh, nano wires, something like that. Yes, so first of all, to the size of the voxel and the question of resolution. Of course, both are limited by the usual good old diffraction limit of light. Despite the fact that some people have published other things, it's not true. This is limited by the diffraction limit. The minimum spacing between two voxels, and that is what we call a resolution, is limited by diffraction. Technically speaking, it's limited by the two photon sparrow criterion. And for 800 nanometers wavelength of light, that is turns out to be roughly 200 nanometers. It scales with the wavelength. So yes, in principle, you can just go to shorter wavelengths like semiconductor chip industry is doing. <clears throat> but in practice, this is not so easy because you have to find systems, photoresists, that is photo initiators, molecules that then absorb at these shorter wavelengths. Um, and this has not been possible so far. Maybe this will become possible. I'm somewhat skeptical because many molecules do have their transitions in the ultraviolet regions and not at 10 times higher uh, transition energies. Um, but what you can do is, and what I have not spoken about at today at all is, you can use all these tricks that people have used in microscopy like stimulated emission depletion, as Stefan Hell has introduced that, to beat the diffraction limit. But then you need not only one laser focus, you need a second laser focus that de-excites the periphery. Now, we have put a lot of work into this and others too. The best that I know of is that you beat the diffraction limit by about a factor of two in all directions, the two lateral directions and the axial direction. So I can tell you, oh, this is almost a factor of 10 uh, in volume less, then it's a big thing. But actually, it's only a factor of two in the lateral size and in the, in the resolution. So um, my conclusion from that was that um, this is not worth the effort. Um, the, it's a much more complicated instrument you have to build then. It's much more difficult to operate and you just get a factor of two. So we stopped at some point looking into this. Funnily, the two step absorption I showed you today is as good as the best stead results I have known, which kind of annoys myself because this is so much simpler than all the stead stuff we have done many years ago. But one direction that we are going now is to combine this idea of two step absorption with stimulated emission depletion. And there I have hope that we can get better because there are no crazy femtosecond lasers involved. With femtosecond lasers, there's always an issue that you do excite the transitions you think you excite, but you can also excite lots of other stuff that you don't want to excite. Uh, and that is, I think, much more well-defined if we use low power continuous wave lasers. So in long words, I'm telling you, we, we start an effort again to beat the diffraction limit more um, in this kind of technology. The second part of your question was about uh, different materials as far as I understood it. Is this right? Yeah. The yeah, mechanical I mean, property of the, yeah. The mechanical properties. Um, yeah. So the polymers that we have been printing, they have, um, Young's moduli in the ballpark of two, three, four gigapascal or so. So for some people, this is hard enough. For other people, it's not hard enough. This, I guess, depends what you want to do. There has been a bulk of work by other groups, not me, um, people taking these polymer structures and subjecting them to pyrolysis, to 
pyrolysis, sorry for that, basically making coal out of it, making carbon, pure carbon out of it. And they have achieved very, very high Young's moduli and very large toughnesses, mechanically speaking. They have even gotten to the point that this is at the known theoretical limits for mechanical stability <clears throat> that are out there. But this is not just the printing. This is the printing together with a post-processing step. Apart from that, we and many others have also converted the polymer structures into something else, converted them into silica structures, converted them into silicon structures. But again, this is not just printing, it's printing combined with some complicated post-processing. Um, and you have to decide whether it's worth uh, what you're doing or not. This tends to be a lot more complicating. The beauty of, of this printing is it's so simple. You, you program something and you get it out. So lately there has been some work um, in terms of direct laser printing also of silica, silica glass, which is also quite a bit tougher mechanically speaking. Um, and what I did not tell you about today is that you can now also directly laser print semiconductors and metals, but we're not into that because of the mechanical properties. We are rather into that because of the electrical properties. So actually I cannot tell you what the mechanical properties are. Okay, very nice. So um, <clears throat> do you have more challenging questions or can you move on? Yeah, we, we, we can move on because I have <laughs> another question, but uh, he already answered it in the second question. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, what about Nick? Do you have any questions or comments for Martin? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, we, we had a lot of conversations uh, between Martin and Nick. So uh, as, as I recall, Martin, I think... Uh, um, you started your career uh, uh, working on more of a, uh, you know, surface science uh, and uh, you know later material interactions. Uh, by that time, more of a say you know uh, 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 carrier dynamics and so on, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so you know what what was the moment that you decide to switch gear and uh, uh, you know. Say uh, work on a, a completely different uh, subject or, or a problem. Yeah, um, that was actually triggered by theory. As you say, I worked for many, many years on ultra fast spectroscopy on semiconductors, all kinds of details. Um, and then my friend Kurt Busch at the time familiarized me with the idea of three dimensional photonic crystals. And I could relate to them because they are, you, in a certain sense, you can say they are like semiconductors for light. This is not quite precise, but that's what resonated with me. And I felt, oh, this is very interesting. I want to make such uh, semiconductors for light, these photonic crystals. And um, I realized that the technologies that were out there were not really well suited for what I wanted to do. So that's how, I, how we got into this um, two photon printing at the time. And for me, um, I felt that I know something about femtosecond lasers. So I felt comfortable there in this arena. And we used femtosecond lasers for many years. And in retrospective, it's a little bit funny that now with our latest work, we kind of get rid of the femtosecond laser uh, with this two-step absorption and go back to very small continuous wave lasers, no high intensities anymore. Okay, good. So, um, Nick, do you have any other or? So this yeah, is your so, last chance, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, uh, my question for Martin, mostly for the benefit of, uh, uh, I would say, our you know, uh, younger you know, uh, faculties and friends, oh. uh, what do you see as, uh, you know, so to speak, uh, you know, I would say, a uh, decision point when mm -hmm. They should think about uh, yeah to switch gear or you know, pick up a, a yeah I'll say different uh, a, a career plan in that sense. Yeah, it's always difficult to give such recommendations. But what happened for me was that I'm an old man, so I worked in some fields for many many years, for more than ten years. And what typically happened is that after a while, uh, it started to bore me. 
Mm. I got sick and tired of it. Um, even if it was successful, you thought, oh, I'm not this again. And you look for something new. And I have usually found new things from discussions with other people. Whenever I changed my place, there were new people I could talk to, like what I just said about Kurt Busch and the ideas of photonic crystals that excited me and stimulated me to do something else. And then quite often, we actually stopped at some point doing the old things. And we did photonic crystals for quite some time. Um, mm -hmm. But then I was more excited about um, making meta materials, which is also an artificial material, mm -hmm. but a big different spirit there. Um, mm -hmm. And we basically stopped doing photonic crystals. Um, I just try to do whatever I, gets me excited. And I must say, I've had the luxury in my life that people let me do what I found exciting. And I was never much forced to do things that I would find boring. Thank so you. I, I think I have to um, here as, ask one thing here. So are you getting bored with this photo, two photo and 3D printing yet? Or <laughs> do you have something no. interesting more <laughs> coming? Um, I am not yet bored. Okay. But I'm more <laughs> excited about this two-step absorption. I see much more potential there in terms of getting to affordable instruments. Um, mm -hmm. In retrospective, I'm not so happy about these instruments that we in Nanoscribe have been selling for half a million or so. Mm -hmm. I think it would be much more attractive for many people if you could do not the same, but something like that with a few thousand euros effort. This would spread this idea much, much more. And it has already spread a lot. I'm not getting bored because we have started things together with people from biology to make scaffolds for cell culture. Even people in medicine are using this two photon technology to mm -hmm. do things for cells in medical hospitals. It's crazy what ideas people have. Um, I was bored about optical meta materials like 10 years ago or so. Oh, and that's okay. when we got into mechanical structures. I felt there was less done at the time in this field. So we got into that. And there are new things coming up. What I like in this field of, of meta materials is that um, you are, as a scientist, you are a designer, basically. You can design materials. You can create ideas for crazy properties. Um, and sometimes they actually work and we can make them in the lab. And that's a fantastic thing if you bring something from an idea to the experiment theory to something mm. that works and sometimes it's even so good that people like to buy it, um, that you can make a product out of it. Not always, you shouldn't expect that. So um, I think there are many more things to be expected in the field of meta materials. That's my view. And we are working hard on 3D printing because that is kind of a prerequisite to make many of um, the things in meta materials that we have been doing. I'm not developing technology for the sake of developing a technology. I'm doing it to then do something that I find scientifically interesting with it. Oh, thanks for a wonder, such a wonderful answer to the stupid question. <laughs> and then actually that's exactly what I love about meta materials from my side as well. And I'm so agreeing with you. Oh, so I have one question from the audience, right, Alice? This is the, from the audience. Yeah, we can ask this after home boss question. Okay. I say professor. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So, yeah. okay. Good. So, so sorry, Hongbo, you're waiting so okay. long. So, now Nothing. it's your time. <laughs> I think you, your recent research is really exciting and amazing. It's re re represented the highest level in this field. So, actually, I did this uh, two photon uh, induced photopolymerization research from the 1996 and got my first publication in 1999. In the 2001, I uh, uh, held uh, microbial research. But uh, later, I am considering what will be the future of the technology, because I always uh, am interested in to do the photo, uh, the optoelectronic devices 
and particularly for the lasing devices. But I have the problem. The poly for polymers, the refract index is always low, 1.5, 1.6. For for example, you the last part you introduce your work on the matter materials. Matter materials certainly in three dimensional is very important. But the problem is you cannot tune the refract index uh, in very deep because uh, the maximum of refract index is, is limited. So we, what we see is in this field, you know, the matter material, always silicon material is very popular. Uh, even if our two photon polymerization, we can do 3D, but the three dimensional matter material is not, uh, not very popular. So my, I wish to have you open air. What will be the, biggest application for this polymer-based uh, 3D structure. Okay. Well, I think what is the biggest industrial application at the moment is what I briefly mentioned in my talk, is to print so-called two and a half dimensional micro optical components, yeah. be it lenses, be it uh, some beam steering unit. Also diffractive optical elements are a huge thing. And I can tell you that we do this with companies and companies do that um, by themselves. Um, you just print the damn diffractive optical element and then you replicate it as many times as you want by known replication technologies. And um, this is a simple application for two photon printing uh, because it's not a truly three-dimensional structure. It doesn't have undercuts or so, but there you take advantage of the fact that you get almost, um, I mean, definitely optically smooth surfaces on a deep sub micrometer level, uh, you have roughnesses. In the best cases that we have looked at, you get root mean squared roughnesses of the surface down to one nanometer of the surface, such that you can now dream about even printing micro optical cavities to enhance via the Purcell effect some emission or so in quantum optics or things like that. I think this is a no nonsense thing, micro optical components, and there the refractive index of the polymer is good enough. But actually at the end, you do not even use the refractive index of the polymer because you misuse it, so to speak, as a stamp. And then you get the refractive index of the material that you stamp into, yes. so to speak. I perfectly agree with you that it would even be even more exciting if we could get um, 3D printing of high refractive index materials. We have put lots of time and effort into that in the past, printing calcorganite glasses, for example, by which you can get refractive indices in the visible um, in the ballpark of 3.2 or so. It's close to silicon what you can get there. The issue is that they as photoresists are much more nasty Actually, some stuff is poisonous that you use there. Um, that's one thing that I think has inhibited spreading this technology a lot. And uh, you must also be aware if you focus into whatever high refractive index material uh, with a lens that has a numerical aperture of 1.4, then your rays come like this and they get refracted like this. So you lose numerical aperture like crazy and your voxel will be far from spherical. It will become extremely elongated, the voxel, in the high index material. And that is unavoidable, I believe, to my understanding, unless you can convince companies like Zeiss or Leica or Olympus to make microscope object objective lenses for you with a numerical aperture of 3.5 or something like that. And I believe. I would have a hard time convincing them to do that. That's a multi-million dollar effort to do that. That's the optics hurdle, really. It's not only a materials hurdle, it's, it's also an optics hurdle. Yeah, another question is uh, actually um, uh, curious. You have done excellent in both in industrial application and also fundamental research. How do you divide your time? How, uh, how percentage you, you use your efforts in the fundamental research? 
Oh, that's that's a tough yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Because I do this for fundamental research for quite a long time, but uh, for the industry application is uh, still I have uh, the much big challenge. For me. Look, I'm a university professor. I teach. I manage all kind of activities. I would say 95% of my time goes to some stuff. 5% I can spend on research. And I try to spend as much as I can of this 5% to things that I find interesting. That's the yeah. best I can answer. Okay. Okay. Okay, where are yeah, So, uh, relating to that, I, I saw some of the aesthetic structures in your PowerPoint. So, do you think any, um, would you propose, like, would you recommend any great applications out of the derived from the aesthetic structures in general? Do you have something specific in mind? No, we have not done much in terms of auxetic structures. We started actually many, many years ago with auxetic structures. Some people have speculated about applications in terms of shock absorbers. Right. Basically, these materials, if you push them to the extreme, mean that uh, upon an impact, they do not change their shape at all. They only mm -hmm. change the size. It's actually funny. If I was made of an ultimate auxetic material with a Poisson's ratio of minus one, and you push right. onto my head, you would get a small version of Martin, but I would still look the same. <laughs> um, so it's, it's mm -hmm. funny. Maybe it can be used as shock absorbers. I'm not sure about that. We have not spent much effort in terms of applying auxetic metamaterials. We have spent more effort in trying to see whether there are other crazy properties mm -hmm. we could achieve by mechanical metamaterials. And we are still playing with this. Um, there are some recent things where we have played with exploiting long range interactions to tailor dispersion relations of elastic waves in a very special way um, mm. that I have enjoyed. And there, those structures, I believe you couldn't make by any other technology either. I think it's still quite open the field for our imagination and for new ideas. Um, Yes, many people now start asking where are the applications of metamaterials and mechanical metamaterials in, in particular. I think there are some. Um, I think the perhaps most prominent application are, are shoe soles. Mm -hmm. This may sound a little bit mundane, but if you look at Adidas or other companies, they shall sell you 3D printed shoe soles that have interesting properties. They're damn expensive, I would say. I don't buy <laughs> such shoes, um, but they have interesting properties. And I think they have a point because you can tailor really the elastic properties of the shoe. You can even make it intentionally uh, inhomogeneous that different parts of the foot experience different things. You could actually dream about introducing chiral effects to correct mm -hmm. some um, orthopedic mistakes um, with your feet and stuff like that. That's commercial. That's an application. Another thing that I hear a lot is um, mechanical metamaterials, acoustical metamaterials for um, noise reduction, for vibration reduction. This is a very, very reasonable thing in my view. It's, it's also quite simple. You just have to tune some local resonators to the frequencies that you care. So we have not done so much in this direction. Perhaps the most crazy idea in terms of applying mechanical metamaterials is the stuff in terms of um, seismic cloaking, if, if you mm -hmm. have seen this. If you scale the idea of metamaterials up from the micrometer range to the tens of meter period range, you can design structures that would say guide a seismic wave, an, an earthquake, in other words, around some nuclear power plant, for example, and thereby protect the nuclear power plant. I find this intellectually very appealing. In the beginning, I'm not doing this. I'm just talking about other people's research. Uh, in the beginning, there were huge criticisms to this work. People argued, oh, this is going to be crazy expensive. You have to drill holes into the earth that are 10 meter deep. But actually, so what? I, I don't know what a nuclear power plant costs you, some billion, I guess. And if you drill a couple of holes in the vicinity and fill them up with something else, uh, so what? This will cost you some millions. 
you would you wouldn't even see the structure at the end. The surface would be flat, uh, and it could do a useful job. And this would exploit many of the ideas that our whole community of metamaterials has come up with on a very very big scale. Yeah, I think I I saw one work um, about the metamaterials made of periodic trees. So you basically form a forest. So that you can reduce down the seismic waves or something. But yes, that's another intriguing. possibility. There you basically use local resonators. The right. earth couples to these resonators, and thereby you can manipulate the elastic surface wave that propagates. Okay, great. Um, so um, Paul, would you have anything to comment? Or I can move on to the audience's question. Or oh, <laughs> I was actually hoping Martin could give us just a a uh, high level preview of his last section, uh, oh. what, he's, what he's doing with metals and semiconductors and also okay. what the bottlenecks are there. You know, what, what is it he'd like to advance that area further? Yeah, I, I, I will try to do this with words and not with view graphs. Yes, thank you. So, um, basically, what we do is we take completely different inks. Um, this can be metal salts in water solution or some zinc oxide compound solved in water. And then the idea is not polymerization. It's not an electronic excitation. You locally heat in this case, what we did not want with the polymers, but you heat with a laser on a submicron scale, some region, and then you um, initiate basically crystal growth at this location. It's quite funny. And this seems to be fairly general. Um, we started doing this with zinc oxide. We just played in the last couple of weeks with all kinds of metal oxides that you could use together with chemists. And everything that we have tried has worked so far. It's, it's not published and it's not serious science so far. We just played with all that stuff. It seems that you can almost print anything. The feature sizes are not 50 nanometer. You get like half a micron or so. Um, but it's fairly reliable. Um, and there, at least for some of the processes, you do not need femtosecond lasers either. You can do it with continuous wave lasers. So what we have done lately is we have printed metals like platinum, put zinc oxide on top, uh, printed another metal like aluminum on top and got electrical diodes by this. We made mem restores, uh, memory devices, arrays of memory devices that actually work like a charm, electrically speaking. And there are applications for these kind of things. You can use them as security features, as unclonable functions, as the community calls it. So this may actually be a no-nonsense application for printing this electronics. This is a question I've always asked myself, why on earth would I print electronics? We have all this computer chip uh, industry. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to compete with them in printing the next mm -hmm. Pentium processor or something like that. <laughs> but there are specialized electronic applications where I think there is a point of individual in individualizing the electronics and not doing the same thing thousands and thousands of times. Um, so that's a super short version. It's something we are diving into. I'm totally excited about because it opens a world of materials I have never thought about, perhaps also magnetic materials that you can print. And in particular, not just structures that are composed of a single material, whatever it is, but structures composed of many dissimilar materials. And that's what most devices are, if you're honest. So in retrospective, all that polymer stuff in a sense is stupid. It's all one material, mostly passive, it's not active. You can do things in terms of micro optics, yes, but I think I'm getting now much more excited about things that are active, that do something. So that's at least the direction we are going into. Yeah, very nice, thank you. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk as well. Okay, thank you so much. So I wrap up um, after I ask uh, the question from the audience. So this is the uh, one. So dear chairman, I want to ask a question. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Professor Martin Wegener for your wonderful talk. I'd like to ask you as shown in, in your PPT, it seems that your works on two photon polymerization and two step polymerization are both for polymer monomers. Have you tried to achieve polymerization while doping other functional material, functional particles 
such as quantum dots or magnetic particles in the monomers? Is there an opportunity to directly manufacture multi-response functional structures in this way? Yes, very good question. You can dope all kinds of things into the polymer, provided the concentration doesn't get too large. And then you tend to get into trouble if you keep it at a level of one or two percent. Um, we have done stuff on doping semiconductor quantum dots into the polymers, doping dye molecules. We have done this for luminescent three-dimensional security features, for example. Other groups have doped magnetic nanoparticles into the polymer to then, via an external magnetic field, manipulate the structure. There's lots of stuff that has been done at the ETH Zürich in this direction, for example. There's also a nice recent example by a consortium involving the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. You can look at it also on the Nanoscribe website where they have um, printed large arrays of little motors you can actuate by an external magnetic field by having magnetic nanoparticles inside mm -hmm. of the polymer. So short answer, yes, you can dope almost anything in there, provided the concentration doesn't get too large. And provided what you have is still optically transparent. Obviously, if you say take metal nanoparticles in a very large concentration and you put them into any monomer, you will get something that looks opaque. And then the laser cannot get into the volume and then you cannot print. That's a somewhat obvious prerequisite that whatever you have is halfway transparent to the light you are using. Perfect, thank you so much. Now um, I wrap up and uh, Alice, could you take over? Oh yes, oh, I'm so, so, so happy. And congratulations, Professor Martin Wagner. Yeah, you talk as always, you know, yeah, the best slides and the contents, everything very clear. So congratulations. We are so proud to say that we have a, a 25, you know, thousands audience uh, we are here listen to your talk and uh, very proud and uh, we deliver this uh, e-certification to you uh, i hope i can you know see you in person in the next year we can you know celebrate all these kind of talks so martin yeah that's yours and uh, today really really great talk we got many great feedbacks i hope you know we have you in the near future we try to you know plan another talk you know for you <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. It has been my pleasure, and it would be my pleasure again to tell you about some other uh, more recent Sabbath things. Conductor and... printing. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Uh, uh, next week we're going to have a tunable vertical with dielectric metal surface. This uh, scientist was from Australia. So next week we uh, Friday we're waiting for you, but uh, that's not the end of today. Uh, because many people here waiting for this finalist. So, Paul, are you ready? Yeah. So, yes, uh, now welcome our chairman on this IKX Young Scientist Award Committee to announce the finalist. Paul, I stop sharing. You can share. Oh, okay. Very good. Let me pull that down. And share the screen. Yes. There we go. It should be. Yep. Okay. Very good. So, uh, Alice and I uh, chaired a committee of uh, all these uh, distinguished members, and we all went through every single application uh, and uh, ranked them. It was a tremendous competition. Uh, we had 47 candidates. Uh, from 14 different countries. And uh, as I said, a very stiff uh, competition to uh, narrow down the finalists. Uh, we ended up uh, selecting uh, 24 uh, finalists. And uh, as you'll see uh, from uh, all around the world, uh, you can see them here. Uh, these are just listed alphabetically uh, by last name. I'll leave these up uh, for a little while so that people who were are competing uh, can see them. Uh, we had uh, Baba Kansori, Wei Bao, Chang Yong Kao, uh, Chao Ji Chen, Jun Chen, my colleague here at UCLA. I stepped away from that one. Uh, Ren Ho Dang, uh, Jesse Gataka, Aristide uh, Gumyong Sen, uh, 
Chuan Yin Hu, Bo Long Huang, Matt Jones, Tong Chao Liu, uh, Yuri Lu, Lauren Marbella, uh, Sarah Muradian, Nakuna Katsuka. I also stepped away from that one once my training. Uh, Nushin Nasiri, uh, Jonathan Rivne, Bhavan Shastri, Li Tang, Felice Teresi, Wen Zhao Wu, Wei Yan, and Jing Chang Zhan. Congratulations to all the finalists and all the folks who competed. Uh, here uh, they are. Uh, the order of presentation is going to be determined by lot. Going. And so uh, the next step will be uh, November 11th. Uh, and so uh, we'll uh, determine who goes. These will be spread over three different dates in December. And so uh, there will be, uh, after that, a rehearsal time in November to check the uh, check everyone's PowerPoint. Uh, please do participate in that if you are a finalist. And then uh, we'll go through the December 2nd, 9th, and 16th for uh, nine, nine, and uh, six presentations there. And after that, uh, announce the winners. And so our our committee will be attending those talks and uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So uh, the top 10 of the 24 finalists will each receive uh, an award, including a $1,000 uh, uh, prize. And that'll be done at the end of the uh, third, third series of talks. And we thank ACS Nano, Applied Physics Reviews, and Light uh, for sponsoring these awards. And so thank you so much for staying on after the talk uh, to hear these. Uh, congratulations again uh, to our finalists. We look forward to all your presentations and, and congratulations to the just amazing applications we got. And thank you so much for the hard work of the committee. Uh, having gone through all 40, 47 myself, I know how much effort it took uh, in order to choose uh, among that uh, very competitive group. Thank you so much, and uh, have a good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world today. And we'll see you next week. Back to you, Alice. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Now we have all these finalists. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Nick, me, so, yeah. So, Martin, very nice. Yeah, today we really have a very nice panel discussion. Hongbo, uh, did Joshua lift? Bu 
的奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞、啊，不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力。不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界为我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感